Welcome to this webinar hosted by 21st Century China Center. I'm Wei Yixi. I'm an assistant professor of political science here at the School of Global Policy and Strategy. Thank you for joining our discussion today. This webinar is recorded and will be available on our website, china.ucsd.edu. Please use the Q&A function on the bottom of your screen to submit your questions. I'll be reading the questions you submit for our speaker during the Q&A time at the end of the presentation. Today, we're delighted to have Anita Plumer, Assistant Professor at the Department of African Studies at Howard University. Anita's research and teaching focus on African political economy, transnationalism, public diplomacy, and Sino-African relations. Anita will present for about 30 minutes. Afterwards, I will start a conversation and then we'll open it up for Q&A. Welcome, Anita. Thank you so much, Wei Yi, for the introduction. I also want to extend a warm thank you to Lei Guang for inviting me to participate in this um, talk this semester. Also to Sarah Schneewen for recommending me. So this afternoon, I hope to spark a conversation on a topic that has been the subject of robust debate in classrooms, at conferences, in the media, and of course, on the street level, especially across Africa. And that's, of course, Africa's engagements with China and what it means for the present and future of African development and politics. But today, I will focus on a particular sites of discourse where the interactions of non-elite Kenyans within contested political spaces are working to understand, deliberate, argue, and respond to the policies of Kenyan state agents and their engagements with actors, diverse actors from China. So I'm gonna share my screen now. So let me know if you can see it. Okay. Yep. Great, thanks. Online discourse on government responses to Chinese intervention in local sites of production, transaction, and consumption provide insights into how Kenyans are deliberating and debating economic change. The major area of concern is that the surge of Chinese manufactured products threatens homegrown industries. This afternoon, I will unpack local street level reactions to China's role in local markets through one widely publicized case in Kenya, a short-lived trade war over fish imports from China. As the case will show, traditional media, social media, and cross-platform messaging software all provide spaces where people share ideas and argue about trade with China and industrialization in Kenya. The ideas that emerge about the impacts of China's economic interventions on the street level are complex come from a diverse set of actors and have evoked a range of responses, especially from government officials. This talk is a part of a chapter that actually examines three cases that illuminates the contradictions between Kenya's domestic policy and its foreign policy with China. The two other cases examine Kenyan perspectives on Ken counterfeit goods on local markets and Chinese migrants in Kenya's in Kenya's uh, largest retail market and wholesale market. So during the Q&A, if you have questions about those areas, we can definitely talk about them. So I'll begin by conceptualizing briefly what I mean when I say street level discourse, followed by um, the case of uh, President Uhuru Kenyatta who said, you know, here comes the fish. We'll then go to Gikomba fish market and then I'll wrap up with some final thoughts. The actors who participate in discourses on Kenya and China include individuals and coordinated groups inside and outside formal and informal institutional frameworks. The actors engaged in Sino-Kenyan discourses from within these formal institutions include Kenyan high-level government officials in the executive, members of parliament, and diplomats. Chinese government officials also work within their own institutions to create and influence ideas and discourses within Kenya. Those outside of political frameworks and policies articulate a street level communicative discourse that seeks agency and change within the formal institutions. These individuals and entities include professionals, activists, people in the informal sector, small business owners, environmental organizations, university students, construction workers, 
engineers, market sellers, fishers, bloggers, and social media commenters. These are all people that I've interviewed over the course of my research. I consider them members of the informed public. The Kenyan informed public has access to information, albeit at different levels and from different sources, that has informed their views on issues. In the case I'll discuss this afternoon, I impact how informed people gathered information, considered arguments and counter arguments and refined their own perspectives. James Fishkin calls this process deliberative or refined public opinion. Fishkin argues that refined public opinion influences institutions and serves as a core component of citizenship and representative democracy. Kenyan informed public speak for themselves and have included their voices in deliberations on Kenya's engagements with China. Kenyan actors outside formal political institutions are operating in ways that have in some cases forced both the Kenyan and Chinese governments to react and in some cases revise policies that negatively impact ordinary people. So the first case, here comes the fish. Kasumu, the county that hosts Lake Victoria, the largest inland source of fish in the country, dealt with a flood of imported frozen tilapia from China beginning in 2016. Local producers argued that they could not compete with the low prices, especially if fish stocks had been declining on the lake. Member of Parliament Nicholas Gumbo of Kasumu said, quote, our concern is that the government allowing fish imports from China is nothing less than a scheme to completely kill the fishing industry in Kenya in total disregard of who is being out, being out at risk and the possibilities of serious job losses for our fisher quote, end quote. In Eldoret, the largest city in the Rift Valley, a truckload of frozen tilapia from China was seized and local officials claimed that the fish was not safe for human consumption and implied that it was illegally smuggled into the country. These two examples provide some context for the debates that erupted in Kenya after the government issued a ban on fish imports from China. In an October 2018 speech at the Small and Medium Enterprises Roundtable, President Uhuru Kenyatta addressed the issue of increased fish imports from China. He began that part of his speech with a statement, and this was in Kiswahili, here comes the fish, which was immediately met with uproarious applause. He went on to excoriate the quality of the imported fish and signaled to Kenyan technocrats to quote, think out of the box on how to stop the imports. The president was sending a message to his own government and Kenyan businesses to be competitive in the fish markets. Within days after his speech, the Kenyan Fishery Service, along with the State Department of Fisheries, Agriculture, and the Blue Economy, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, issued a letter to 16 importers, primarily from China, that the government would not approve applications to import tilapia. Kenyatta carefully responded to mounting dis dis dissatisfaction from fishers, processors, and local distributors by saying, that imported fish was undercutting local industries. China's acting ambassador at the time, Lu Xu Huang, initially responded by calling Kenya's actions a trade war and threatened tariffs similar to those China issued in response to similar actions taken by the United States. There was also a report in the local press that in a bilateral meeting, Chinese diplomats stated that they would withhold future funds for the standard gauge railway, which has been a signature project um, to include rail lines that connect major East African cities. The diplomats' remarks resulted in a public relations crisis as they came under sharp and swift criticism from Kenyan traditional and social media sources. Days after the ban was issued, the director of fisheries, the fisheries ministry issued a statement that the ban was put on hold for unexplained reasons. The Chinese government also retracted their comments, but the incident contributed to the discourse on China's role in Kenyan markets. The erosion of the local fish industry has been on the agenda of local Kenyan policymakers whose top-down approach to solving the problem 
fits under the moniker of the blue economy. The blue economy approach to development is closely related to another uh, developmental agenda called the big four agenda, which has components um, that are linked to ensuring food security and employment. But it also connects with China's presence in the Kenyan economy and the blue economy policy also affects trade policy by way of the fish imports and infrastructural investments by way of the standard gauge railway. So you can imagine a web of domestic policies aimed at economic development being linked to foreign interests, both private and public, and ordinary people trying to make sense of their own government's policies within this reality. The blue economy approach originated after President Kenyatta convened a task force in 2017 to examine how the country could sustainably harness the economic potential of marine resources along Kenya's coast and in its freshwater lakes. The blue economy blueprint includes a wide range of economic sectors, such as fisheries and aquaculture, maritime transport, tourism, environmental conservation, mining, and energy. Conceptually, it focuses on the ocean coasts and marine industries as integral sites of both economic development and environmental sustainability. Spatially, it posits that the ocean and freshwater resources can be harnessed as new engines of growth that will generate new trade circuits, employment, and industrial growth around the organizing principle of integrating socioeconomic development with sound environmental management and preservation. It consists of government policies that focus on innovative technologies, the promotion of local entrepreneurs, and local community access to capital markets and infrastructure, and it also promotes the idea that these development spaces provide an opportunity to practice sustainability and social capital building along with economic growth. So keep that in mind um, as I move forward and discuss the street level perspectives, the rationale behind government policies um, as it relates to the fishing industry. So we're gonna leave Lake Victoria and go to Gikomba Market. The move by Kenyatta to, to ban fish imported from China, which was quickly suspended, was in response to social media reports and general citizen discontent about the decline in locally sourced fish stocks, the price of imported fish, and concerns about food safety. Social media commenter Carol Musioka, you see um, here on, on the left, this slide, let me actually go back started a Twitter conversation when she microblogged a trip to Gikomba's fish market to talk with local sellers about imports and the ban. The first tweet in the series was a photo of the front page article in the Daily Nation titled, China may ban the standard gauge railway loan in a fish ban row. She stated that she wanted to know the backstory behind this headline and continued on to explain that the Gakomba fish market had been built in 1964. And until four years ago, most of the fish sold at the market came from Lake Victoria. Talking with a woman fish vendor, Musioka learned that the fish imported from China is less expensive and it has been relatively easy to pass off the imported fish to quote, undiscerning clients, implying that most people at the fish market would prefer fish sourced at Lake Victoria over imported fish. Complete with photographs of fish samples imported from China and locally sourced fish. So the next slide shows the comparison here that she calls the fish vendor um, Our Lady Fish Seller. To the left here, you see the smaller tilapia that is supposedly the imported tilapia versus the larger tilapia to the right, which is um, locally sourced tilapia. She wrote, our lady fish seller asked a very simple question. How can fish, which has landed here all the way from China, have an expiry date of 2020, while my fresh fish does not last beyond a few days? What kind of chemicals are they putting? In another tweet, in, a ser in the series, she wrote, we found hundreds of fish traders selling raw and cooked fish. And our lady trader pointed out to us that the Nile perch 
is the in the market is genuine. It's some of the it's just some of the tilapia is quote fake. But her concern is that we have allowed potentially harmful fish to flood the market. At the core of this interaction between Musioka and the market seller is an interrogation of globalization and its fallout. The imported fish are characterized as fake products from a faraway place, rootless and disconnected from the producers, whereas the local Nile perch is, quote, genuine, localized, of quality and fresh. Musioka's placement of fake in quotation marks implies that the fish is counterfeit, but the designation of the perch being genuine is not given the same treatment. The quality fear storyline appears in this case, as it does with others, on the influx of counterfeit products in Kenya. The phrase, quote, plastic fish, to describe fish from China gained traction online and entered the public debate when politicians, including the president himself, referred to it as such. Both the discourse-related practices of socially networked Kenyans expressing their, quote, political truth online and discursive or language bound practices on the presence of Chinese made products in local markets convey a form of political improvisation. Some of the critical street level communications on China and Kenya contain threats of misinformation as it has become commonplace worldwide as many more people amplify their ideas on social media platforms. And to apply Ashil Mbembe's thinking in the ways Kenyans characterize China as they discuss counterfeit fish, they are engaging in a political communication that results from particular encounters with co colonization and violence. And Mbembe writes that, quote, the post-colony is characterized by a distinctive style of political improvisation, by a tendency to excess and lack of proportion as well as by distinctive ways identities are multiplied, transformed, and put into circulation, end quote. This style of political improvisation reflects one perspective that is con commonplace in the street level discourse on social media platforms and in direct facing conversations with Kenyans. It makes up a storyline of not only Chinese products invading local markets, but also Chinese people occupying market spaces. Storylines are up for negotiation and deliberation in online spaces. The China-related storyline in Kenya that fish imports from China are plastic at first glance appears absurd. The plastic fish story is in fact an example of political improvisation. Communication between socially networked Kenyans illustrate an assemblage of disparate perspectives that are chaotically moving toward insight and understanding in the new interactions and relationships between both Kenyan and Chinese actors. Until recently, a fish seller in Kenya or anywhere in Africa may have felt that their economic position was secure. Unless dried or salted, fish must be quickly and safely transported from source to market. However, the causes of decline in the fish sales is more complicated than just trade policy. Uganda, which controls 45% of Lake Victoria, had also reported declines in fish spanning 30 years, including the closure of 18 fish processing factories in recent years. Kenya had 20 fish processing factories in the year 2000, and by 2018, the number fell down to two. Producers, wholesalers, and distributors all earned money through a network based on localized transactions. In recent years, the perception has been that imports from China have flooded the market and driven down the prices. Mashini Ntiba, the principal secretary of uh, the Ministry of Fisheries, told Parliament that local production could not meet demand and that in 2019, the nation faced a critical fish shortage, which if you're in Kenya, that would create a crisis because fish is part and parcel of the culinary culture of, um, of Kenya. He attributed the decline in fish in Lake Victoria to increased competition from fishers in neighboring Tanzania and Uganda, and to the increased border security at Lake Victoria that prevented Kenyan fish catchers from traveling beyond Kenya's border, maritime border that is. So another problem was that the declining fish stocks of Nile perch on the lake uh, was due to pollution and unsustainable and illegal fishing practices, which had destroyed uh, breeding grounds. Kenyan, Tanzanian and Ugandan authorities 
actually responded to these petitions by fish catchers, processors, and distributors to address illegal fishing that had a deleterious effect on the industry. Within a year of a new enforcement regime, which included stricter penalties and military patrols on the lake, communities and government researchers reported higher fish harvests. So here we see a case where, you know, a constituency made a demand on three governments and the three governments responded and it resulted in higher fish harvests. The Gukomba market trader in Carol Musioka, however, communicated a different perspective on the issue of low supply and high demand. Musioka wrote, Our Lady Fish Trader said that there is enough local supply if they're given the infrastructural support around cold rooms. These are uh, either freezers or refrigerated um, lockers. But the array of cooked fish was an amazing experience to see and smell. Great potential to create a foodie experience. So this micro blog, you know, had both an investigative component and also a um, a foodie component to it, which made it really engaging, I think, to, to um, folks on social media. Another issue that traders had long complained about in person and had been covered in the press were the physical conditions at the market. Musioka wrote, meanwhile, we walked past many of these displays, traders who turn over thousands daily, but lack roads, covered stalls, and proper sanitation yet provide a critical service. When Kenyatta made the speech that sparked the fish ban controversy, his audience at the conference was small business owners. The remarks were as much intended for local entrepreneurs and investors as it was for technocrats in the Ministry of Fisheries. A recurring statement in the, in the discourse, on the elite produced discourse, is that Kenyan businesses must be competitive. In the post, Musioka and the trader direct their focus on inefficiencies at Lake Victoria and at Gikomba Market. So here, um, the issue of infrastructure um, is articulated at the source of the product and at the site of where consumers buy the product. Perhaps the proposal to invest in modern cold storage at Lake Victoria and Gikomba Market is too simplistic. However, these tweets break open the issue of what infrastructure should be prioritized and who should fund it. Producers and vendors in both locations have been lobbying the government for minimal investments in infrastructure. Although Gikomba is Kenya's most popular and largest open air market, its dilapidated structures do not reflect the millions of shillings that are transacted there on a weekly basis. The market experienced eight fires in six years, the most recent one in 2018, killing 15 people and injuring 70 others. The market stalls lack basic amenities needed for safe and secure business transactions. Permanent stalls, reliable electricity, plumbing, clean water, toilets, roads, walking paths, and storage facilities. So whose responsibility is it to formalize that space and make conditions decent for vendors and consumers? The question was debated in the tweets in response to Musioka's microblog. Jasiri wrote in response to Musioka, once we get people's heads to move beyond China bashing and woke statements, we, can we ask ourselves, why don't we even have cold rooms at uh, the Victoria Beach shores? How many years of excellent noise making experience do we have, yet we can't make noise for the right reasons? Another Twitter user, Monsieur the Marquis, wrote, for the longest time, there hasn't been electricity at the most productive beaches, leaving the fishermen at the mercy of refrigerated truck owners. A few have come up recently, though they still can't match the supply. The range of perspectives on the problems with Kenya's fish industry extends beyond focusing on China. The discourse deepens as agents look within for alternative explanations for the decline in local competitiveness. The subtext of Jasiri's tweet is that China is a scapegoat for failures in sound infrastructural investments. The dialogue shifted to an entrepreneurial tone with participants sharing accounts of homemade freezers fueled by methylated spirits, which is very dangerous, and solar freezers. One respondent wrote that stakeholders 
should want more for themselves, while another said she had wished that the president would be firm and decisive for once and stop putting and to put a stop to the Chinese blackmailing and ensure that the blue economy is able to create jobs for our people. Now, it's interesting that she evokes the blue economy here in this tweet, um, but the Chinese blackmailing comment was of course in reference to the threat made from the acting ambassador from China to withhold SGR funds if the fish ban had continued. The participants in this discussion connected the conditions on Lake Victoria and Gikomba Market to President Kenyatta's blue economy, and for good reason. The political messages transmitted by government officials on the blue economy and the Big Four agenda focus on job creation and food security. In his 2019 Madaraka Day National Address, Kenyatta stated, quote, we are embarking on building a vibrant maritime and blue economy that will elevate and transform our food security and create employment opportunities for our people while expanding our economy, end quote. However, investments in the fish industry also promote industrial policy and small and medium-sized enterprise development because the fish has to go through a value-added process before it goes to market. The discourse on social media and on the street show that the government's political messages are not aligned with policies that address street level market issues. Um, a, a tweet from Jasiri responded to the thread, quote, with legislative weight behind it, how long do you think it would have taken to energize the beach? We, have, we just have to accept that there's no interest from leadership, end quote. Online threads like the one Musioka started advance the idea that development, need, development needs to be relevant to people on the street in Kokomba and on the shores of Lake Victoria. Street level discourses yield low cost street level policy fixes. Street level deliberations inform the discourse from a practical vantage point that broadens the man mantra of looking east to include policy priorities that look within. Contributors on both social and traditional media platforms actually speculated that the government lifted the fish ban over wholesale fish distributors lobby, who lobbied to suspend it because local production capacity could not meet consumer demand. So actual importers within Kenya were partly responsible for the lifting. If the government also were to institute tariffs or restrict trade policies, that would benefit industrial policy, it would be at the cost of angering constituents who benefit from the stiff competition in markets, and in this case, low cost fish. On social media, commenters attributed the swift reversal to China's explicit threats to withhold funding from H uh, SGR. So we see in the deliberations as to why the Kenyan government lifted the fish ban. There are multiple perspectives on that matter. So, um, in closing, we go back now to the central question. How does China fit into Kenya's vision for itself? Big policies such as Vision 2030, the Big Four, the Blue Economy, which in some part relate to Kenya's foreign policy toward China, have encountered questions and in some cases resistance in the street level discourse. The street communicates different priorities for economic development that tend to focus on how to overcome specific barriers to trade and production within local marketplaces. The street level also uses bottom-up communication channels to make demands on the government. The announcement of the fish ban, of the ban on fish from China, sorry, was a result of pressure from constituents, for example. The flip of the fish ban policy implies a contradiction in how the government views itself as a driver of industrialization. The policy reversal sent a message to Kenyans in the fish sector that under big development agendas, local industries may be sacrificed to allow market forces to solve the problem of fish supply meeting demand. Social media commenters argue that Kenya's decision was a direct result of pressure from a foreign power, China. The argument in essence is that the central government willingly protects the economic interests of China over the interests of people in the local fish, fish industry. So thank you, Wei. I'll let you take it from here. 
Thank you, Anita. That was a fascinating, fascinating case study uh, that we just heard. And uh, let me start by reminding the audience that you can submit your questions by using the Q&A function um, in, 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 the, um, in your Zoom interface. Um, and I will be reading these questions and combining a few if they are similar and raising them to Anita. Um, Anita, but let me first start um, by asking a question of my own, uh, and it's more on the clarifying side. Uh, as I was hearing uh, this really fascinating case that's been going on, um, I was wondering whether um, if you could say a little more about the specific timing um, of the uh, of the conflict we're seeing uh, between China and Kenya, and why it's a happen. It sounds like it started kind of ha happening in 2016 and continuing to today. Uh, why did it start escalating then? And what was happening in terms of China's China's um, exporting policy at the time, in combination what with what Kenya's trade policy at the time in the agricultural sector that may have given rise to to what we see on the ground. Okay, absolutely. So. Um, so in 2016, that's when the story started breaking in local media about frozen tilapia entering local markets. And I think it was very shocking for Kenyans to see that because they're like, wait a second, we have Lake Victoria, we produce fish. I don't think folks understood the supply issue on the other end with uh, fish stocks depleting over time. So of course, wholesalers, um, Felt, filled that void by importing fish. At the same time, China also, you know, globally has become the largest exporter of fish everywhere in the world. So, you know, you have China's exports on one hand in terms of, you know, entering markets globally with frozen fish. You have the decline in fish stocks in Lake Victoria and people seeing this and saying, wait a second, you know, since when are we importing fish from China? Now, this also corresponds with major infrastructural projects happening in Kenya at the time, financed by Chinese um, um, uh, entities and the projects being carried out by Chinese firms. So this case isn't in isolation from other projects that Chinese companies and the Chinese government is facilitating in Kenya. So I think it had a visceral reaction when people gradually saw the influx of Chinese imports because they're experiencing the influx of you know Chinese counterfeit or counterfeit goods from China, you know roads being constructed, you know um, schools being constructed, um, all these projects happening. So by 2018, um, as you know, it started with traditional media sources, then social media picked it up. By 2018, interestingly enough, the president decided to make a public statement about it. And it was just extraordinary because, you know, trade policy is trade policy. He knew that at local supply couldn't meet demand, but he was being populist in that moment, which I didn't, it didn't come through here, but that's another layer of the internal politics behind how this case became politicized for his party, who was being attacked on a number of fronts. The primary front was the issue of debt. He was under a lot of criticism because of loans owed to Chinese financial institutions. So in a populist move at this conference, he goes on and he calls these fish plastic fish. And when he tells the technocrats, hey, you need to do something, the technocrats did something. <laughs> you know, the actual letter was released in the media that was sent to these export processing companies. But yet there was a contradiction on what people were experiencing on the ground. So the fish ban only lasted about six months. It was very swift, right? And there was a, it, and then there was a reversal. Um, and after the Kenyan government and Chinese government sorted that out, they both then retracted their statements and dialed back. Mm -hmm. So then that was a betrayal <laughs> for people on the street level, right? right. So um, Kenyatta and his party lost a lot of credibility as you know, they were rolling out other domestic policies too. And people then saw the contradictions and said, wait a second, you know, it's not a matter of China here. It's a matter of our own leaders not working in our interests. But there would have been a crisis if people didn't have fish 
to eat, seriously. So that's why, you know, when folks said it was actually local importers that pressured the government to lift the ban, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. <laughs> because imagine not having, you know, a staple food available to you. But, um, but I'm not a China specialist. <laughs> but what I do know is that um, uh, this trend has been happening not only in Kenya, but in other, you know, especially coastal African countries where fish is a part of the diet. Um, and this corresponds again with China's role within the fish industry globally. The technology is there in terms of fish farms, which that was another issue that came up. Um, when I interviewed people on the coast in Kenya, I interviewed some fishers that said that, you know, Chinese owned fishing trawlers were fishing these fishing grounds in Lamu, mm -hmm. um, it's in Northern Kenya. And they talked about the technology. But what's interesting is the fishers were very nuanced and very practical about it. They said that the trawlers likes um, um, larger fish, but Kenyans along the coast actually like eating smaller fish. They said, you know, it's not, it's seen as bad luck eating fish that's too large, right? So they said, why can't they just, you know, give us the smaller fish and they can just take the larger fish, right? So they're working out, <laughs> the, you know, the practicality of it instead of, because the smaller fish end up dying too. So this is how people are understanding it. It's quite practical, you know, how to solve these issues. So that was a long answer, I hope. <laughs> that, is, that is fascinating. And thank you for providing that richer background and understanding um, the specific story you told in your, in your presentation. Now we have accumulated a bunch of questions. So okay. I'm going to uh, try to combine a few that may be along similar lines. And it's interesting you mentioned, you know, how, how the case you presented is not an isolated phenomenon. And I'm going to ask this question raised by Victor, um, who is also asking about a more general, uh, a broader framework under which this is happening, which is uh, whether you see Kenya being generally open or not so open to foreign direct investment, no. and to what extent political parties take advantage of this street level conversation to win more votes. Or um, are there many parties pro Chinese investment? Yeah, so Victor, these are two really good questions. So yes, Kenya is is very open to FDI. You find that most African governments say we want investment and trade over aid, right? So that's now the mantra across Africa. Interestingly enough, you know, the US, UK, and France have more FDI in Africa than China. That tends not to be China's model at this point. If there's FDI, you know, we've seen. Um, Ethiopia is probably the case with the largest influx of FDI in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so yes, absolutely. But we know the narrative around FDI in Africa that Africa is a bad business address, right? That's, that's the narrative is that the, the cost of doing business is, is so high that it's not worth investing in Africa. Um, so that's why China's behavior in Africa tends to be market seeking and resource seeking, meaning they want to penetrate African markets, makes a lot of sense, that's globalization. And in resource rich countries, they want to have their foot in the door in the extractive sector because North American and European country, uh, companies have traditionally already been in that, in that space. So um, we have seen a shift um, in FDI, it's so new that I don't think we know the outcome of it yet because there's so much discontent around lending and so much fear around lending in, in some countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, Kenya being one of them, that um, the Chinese government has said that they're switching into a public-private partnership model. So that's like the closest to FDI that we can see, but we don't know how this is gonna play out yet, right? This was just announced in terms of what these models actually look like. And this is in line with my understanding that the Chinese government is trying to encourage more private companies and not parastatals to invest more in Africa. They're really trying to encourage Chinese entrepreneurship abroad and trying the, um, um, the non-state influence system and uh, development projects. So we'll see how that plays out. Um, yes, Victor, it's been politicized, this issue, China 
in Africa, in China and Kenya in particular. So let me just give you one example. So the ruling party in Kenya is the Jubilee Party. President Uhuru Kenyatta rolled out a policy called the BBI Initiative, which is Building Better Bridges Initiative. And this is to help build national unity because there's been so much division within different ethnic groups within Kenya. So one of the signature you know, goals or projects of BBI is to give more uh, power to local counties. They call it uh, devolution. So instead of the centralized government, you know, passing directives down to local policy um, counties, they say, okay, we allow, you know, local counties to develop their own developmental agendas and their own developmental goals. And the goal of this is to help devolve, you know, policies and politics. So it's not ethnically based on, you know, whoever's president. But there's a lot of cynicism because he promotes, Kenyatta has promoted BBI alongside these large scale infrastructure projects, which people perceive favor his ethnic group and not the nation in terms of where projects are located, in terms of the homelands. So it's poisoned the well a little bit because people are making these connections um, because the projects aren't equitably, the infrastructure projects are not equitably distributed across the country. So it becomes very apparent that, okay, you're using you know, Chinese finance and infrastructure to help people in your home area. What about the rest of the country? We're paying for this too. So people are curious to know how resources are gonna be allocated under this better building better bridges initiative. But people make the direct connection between um, Kenya's foreign policy being used to benefit him personally and the perception that it's benefiting his ethnic group. I have a different take on that, right? I think it has to do more with class and elites using this relationship to benefit themselves. Um, and it's almost too obvious that politicians will use their connections with the Chinese government and access to funding to help their own constituencies. A study um, was done a few years ago that looked at where infrastructure projects were located in every county in Africa and or every province or county in Africa. And of course, the provinces where presidents came from tended to have more infrastructure projects. This isn't surprising. So um, there, there have been individual cases in which politicians have called for um, the deportation of immigrants. But interestingly enough, um, it has been not only Chinese immigrants, but Indian, Somalis, and Ugandans. So it's very interesting how um, immigration has been politicized. And there have been members of the ruling party that have made those statements. So it's, it's not as if one party is pro-China and one party is anti-China. Anti it's more nuanced than that. Thank you, Anita. I want to share on a comment from the audience, an op a very interesting observation, and this is from David Edek, uh, who's been researching the dairy industry in Kenya and East Africa, and he encountered the exact same economic political phenomena regarding the threat promise of cheap dairy imports from the U.S. And so uh, with that, David raises the question whether there this really is just a clash between market development and social development. Um, and, um, and in addition, maybe we should think about whether there is inherent tension between the impact of trade, which tends to manifest itself um, very immediately, versus if you are to take the approach to uh, encouraging development, pro-developmental policies, which often take a longer time horizon for it to materialize. Yeah, I agree. Uh, did you want me to respond? Oh, I agree with everything yeah. you said. <laughs> um, in terms of um, the clash between market development and social development, yes. In this particular piece, I actually look at industrialization. So I, I, I try to fit it squarely within government rhetoric and try to turn it, well, I don't turn it on itself. I'm arguing that the street level is questioning this too. Um, but absolutely, there are major contradictions 
like glaring contradictions here. I guess, I guess something that is um, sometimes puzzling to me is that this sort of tension is not unique to Kenya, it's not unique to Africa, and it's also not unique to just Chinese investment. But it does seem that it often is China and the presence of Chinese investment, the Chinese products, um, that tends to attract the most controversy. Now, is it your observation that this is mostly because China's, you know, what China's doing is still relatively new, or is it because there are some truths to um, aspects of how Chinese companies operate, on uh, the the nature and you know, the quality of the Chinese products maybe are um, lacking in some respect com compared to the local products or other types of imports? What's your sense? Yeah, I think it's really complicated. I think, yes, um, even though China's presence is not new, but it's in terms of scale and penetration, it's become more intense. And I think folks are really trying to make sense of yet another foreign power intervening within their borders, because the last, you know, major case of that would, it was the Cold War. And then before that, it was colonization. Um, but at the heart of your question is how is China behaving differently from other foreign pa pa uh, entities operating in Africa in this moment? And I think that's what, that needs to be at the heart of the research. What is happening differently here? What is China doing differently that the United States or UK or France, you know, the Western powers, how they're interfacing on the ground and then also how they're interfacing on the macro level. Um, and I think that's what we're trying to unpack because yes, you know, it's been 20 years since this new surge, it's still pretty new and it's still pretty opaque, um, but it's becoming more and more intense. Um, so I think more research needs to be done in research into specific countries, right? Because the culture of Kenya, it's very different than even Tanzania and Uganda. Um, and the waves of migrants coming from China are different, right? The actors operating on the ground are very different. Um, so understanding their interests and the perceived power that they have on the ground is also very important because people will feel insecure and threatened if they feel like some outside entity is coming that's displacing them if the government is treating the outside entity better than their own citizens, that also becomes a source of tension that we that I think people are experiencing and trying to understand. So this idea of people deliberating and trying to understand the ambiguities, because I think it's more ambiguity than anything in terms of what these outcomes actually mean for people's lives. I don't you know, I don't think folks really know what does it mean when they're, you know, increased uh, market sellers from China selling the same things you're selling. Mm -hmm. Now, the issue of quality, I think um, that is linked to, you know, xenophobia and stereotypes. Um, because if it weren't for low cost Chinese goods in Kenya, there would literally be millions of Kenyans out of work. So it's low cost Chinese goods that are employing more people literally in Kenya than the manufacturing sector. And the government knows this. So you take away people's economic lifelines. They're very careful if you say, oh, we're gonna ban you know, low cost goods. No, people don't want that. Because anywhere you go, you know, whether it's in the city or out in rural areas, you see low cost goods that are accessible to people. Why? because they can't afford goods made in, you know, the US or, you know, high cost goods. Where people have issues is with counterfeit products. I think that's the one area where people aren't as forgiving on the street level um, because there's a competition there with importers who import, you know, genuine goods and then the counterfeit goods. That's where it becomes tricky. But I think there are layers of prejudice and xenophobia in the association of low cost Chinese products initially, but if you talk to market sellers, that's not the case because they're making money off of these transactions. 
Fascinating. I wonder if that's going to foreshadow the future of U.S.-China trade war as well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Let me tell you, if people go to Walmart and they can't afford, <laughs> seriously, constituents are going to be upset because that, at the, with the fish issue, that, that was the issue. The government leaders knew uh, if we put tariffs on this, on this fish, we're not going to be elected because people won't be able to afford it. So it's, it's tricky. <laughs> it's really tricky. And this is actually a nice segue to our next question um, by Jeff Hoffman, who asks us who, uh, whether you could speak a bit more about how street level sentiment toward China as business part partner is changing in general. And if you were to forecast a few years out, uh, do you see better cooperation or more friction overall? Okay. So in terms of, I'm, I'm gonna try to get the first part of the question right. We have seen shifts in terms of what's happening on the street level, in terms of, you know, how products are imported, go through distributors and then sold retail and markets. And sometimes there's some more phases, you know, some more steps beyond that. What from folks that I've talked to, when I started my research in 2008, so I started interviewing market sellers, mostly women actually in 2008, women who traveled to China, who would travel to um, Southern China and also travel to um, West Asia with goods and they would bring them back on planes like when it was really small scale. Um, and back then, you know, Africans generally, they were intermediaries in this process, right? They had a role in terms of the import in wholesale distribution. Where people are becoming nervous is now with the increased migration, you find more and more um, Chinese merchants at the importer side, at the wholesale distribution side, and at the retail side. So people are like, wait a second, I was making good living, you know, at Mombasa port importing things and then distributing it, and that's changing. So there's actually a perception now, and this is another part of this project, I didn't get to this case, where they feel that Chinese um, importers are paying bribes to people at the port to streamline their goods so their goods can fast track from Mombasa port to Nairobi, whereas African importers have to deal with more bottlenecks. And I'm talking about time, you know, it could take three or four months to get your goods through versus a few weeks. So there's a perception that there's corruption happening, um, which is ironic because the slowdown at the port is linked to um, the government trying to uh, crack down on counterfeits, right? So it's, it's a very strange irony. So when you see fewer and fewer Africans in this transact, in this um, supply chain, in the transactions, that's when people are becoming very, very nervous. And there's a sense of discontent there. So I know that was one part of the question. Was there another part or I should so have written it. you see in the future, there's going oh. to be more cooperation or more okay. friction in general. Yeah, I tend not, to, I don't, I don't try to predict the future. Yeah. <laughs> I try, you know, that's why I, I can't, yeah. I don't know what's gonna happen only because the political situation is, is, you know, Kenya is a very stable country. You know, they've had reasonable growth rates, but with the growing numbers of youth who are experiencing unemployment, who, you know, are making demands of their government in terms of representation and accountability, I don't know what the political situation in Kenya or any African country means for China and its prospects with China. I think that's an error. I can predict <laughs> that in right. China may err in thinking that there's stability within these regimes in cutting these deals. But what if the next election, the president says, I'm not paying those loans. Those are illegitimate loans. Of course, we know the ripple impact. That can have a devastating impact on the uh, economy. But that's a possibility. Um, there's a lot of instability that comes with democracy, as we know in this country. <laughs> there's yeah. a lot of instability that comes with democracy, but it's the same thing in Africa too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there has been for years this discussion of risks involved in yes. Chinese 
financing and Chinese investments overseas, yeah. but really when it comes to what's actually happening in terms of capital flowing yeah. outside of China, we haven't actually seen that many changes into developing economies. It's still roaring forward. Yeah. So, yeah. And it's very hard to predict what's going to happen in the future. Uh, so we only have a couple of minutes left and I just want to highlight one comment and then um, one question if you could uh, answer quickly and it ties into what you were saying earlier about youth. Um, the question from Enrique, which is uh, the, about the presence of Chinese pop culture in, in Kenya and whether you see any similar backlash to cultural imports from China. And I just also want to throw in, although not terribly related to the pop culture question, but very much relevant to today's discussion, comment from Sarah uh, Schneewind that looking back in history in the American Revolution, Chinese products were also at the center of nationalism. When mm -hmm. colonists boycotted what they called the, the baubles of Britain, they were talking about tea, silk, porcelain, all from China. The tea thrown overboard in Boston Tea Party was tea guan in tea. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, mm -hmm. So maybe you could, if you could just talk a little bit more about the pop culture uh, phenomenon, and then we will end our uh, talk today. Okay, I actually don't know anything about Chinese pop culture in Kenya. So <laughs> what I've looked at is um, how the Chinese government has, tr through the Confucius Institutes, have mm -hmm. tried to encourage um, Kenyan university students to study Mandarin and learn more about um, Chinese culture from a government perspective, right? Chinese culture is very, very broad. I don't know that much about pop culture in Kenya. So if you know of anything that's been written on it, I would love to see it. Or um, if nothing has been written on it, I think you should <laughs> because- um, yeah, I, I wanted to raise that question because I feel like, I don't know and I'm so curious. <laughs> yeah. So What's well, your next project? Oh, well, yeah. Oh man, that, that sounds really hard. But um, <laughs> It's interesting in Nigerian films, China has, you know, surfaced in Nigerian films and in some literatures, West African literatures. Um, but yeah, I would love for you to point me to if they're Kenyans, you know, into pop culture, I, I would really like to see that. In terms of um, Dr. Schneewin's piece, yes, history is very important. Because one thing we haven't talked about, we have one minute left, is this idea that China is perceived as a neo-colonial power in Africa. And this is something that I'm grappling with in my own research. How do you pinpoint or conceptualize neo-colonialism with an actor who historically has not viewed itself as an imperial colonial power in the way that the West has? And I think historical markers become very important in terms of identifying way, you know, which you asked about earlier, what is China doing differently, right? But looking at it within an African context, understanding how history has informed African perceptions of foreign intervention in terms of the trends, whether it's infrastructural development, debt, we didn't talk about military, military, you know, culture, you know, all of the, in politics, all of these things uh, provide the context that's needed, I think, to understand um, how these new interventions are being interpreted and what they mean for the present and the future. So, um, yeah, history is very important um, in terms of the contextualization. So, yeah, I really appreciate that comment. Thank you, Anita. Um, fascinating, fascinating, fascinating talk and fascinating discussion today. Thank you all for being with us today. Please stay in touch and sign up for our updates at china.ucsd.edu. This webinar will be available on video and podcast in the next few days on our website, china.ucsd.edu, where you can also sign up for upcoming webinars. Thank you, Anita, and thank you, everybody, for being with us. Thank you so much, Wei. Take care.